Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Permobile Academy webinar series. Hope that you are all having a wonderful Wednesday, and we appreciate all of you. I'm Janet Bernstein, your moderator for today's webinar entitled The Power of Preparation, What to Consider for a Wheelchair Evaluation. This webinar is brought to you by Permobile Academy, the Permobile Foundation, and the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Um, as we, we would just like to uh, thank you all for all of the hard work that you are doing out there. If you are our providers or our clinicians and in light of everything is going on in the world around us, we hope you're staying safe and thank you for attending today. And now I am very happy to introduce to you Catherine Sweeney, a Regional Clinical Education Manager for Permobile, who hails from the Pacific Northwest. Catherine, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jenneth. And hello to everyone that is on the webinar today. I just, again, want to thank you all for coming and giving us your time. Uh, my a quick background introduction to myself is I am a physical therapist. I've been a therapist for 30 years, the last 15 years of which were spent in a wheelchair seating clinic uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So I just wanted to um, first kick off before we get into the nitty gritty of today's topic, I first want to get a sense of who all is attending. Jenneth, do you want to launch our first poll? I would love to. So here is our first poll. Please answer if it is safe for you to do so. Um, who is joining us today on this webinar? Individual or consumer? Um, a physical PT, OT, other clinician? Someone that works for, at for an equipment provider? Or a family member of an individual with a mobility impairment? So it looks like we've got most of our um, attendees reporting so far, about 76%. And we have 8% uh, individuals or consumers, which is great because this is really geared for you. Um, and then 50% uh, other clinicians. And then we have about 36% who are working with an equipment provider and 3% that are family members of an individual. And then of course, um, we do have a few people that are popping in the question box saying that they fit multiple categories of being a consumer that uses mobility equipment and also our provider. So that's great. Sorry for not giving you that option. Thank you all, close that poll, back to you. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Jenneth. And I'm so happy to hear of the mix of folks that are on this webinar. And again, as Jenneth said, this is really geared toward preparing folks for what to go into an evaluation thinking, but that could be um, from multiple aspects. So the consumer preparation, also clinicians knowing how to um, really think about what questions to ask the consumer and help uh, in that prescription process by asking the right questions. So let's go ahead and first um, start with what we always like to start with at Permobile is the why. And at Permobile, we're guided in our product development and adv advocacy efforts by the belief of our founder, Dr. Per Uden. And he believed early on that every person with a disability has the right to have that disability compensated as far as possible. And this continues to be the guiding principle at, at Permobile, where we believe that mobility is a human right. And when we think about aids with the same technical standard, this is essential because, as we all know, technology continues to advance at a faster pace than ever. So in terms of how that might apply to you, the individuals we serve, we look at what is developmentally appropriate across the lifespan, and we recognize that an assistive device must enable the user to participate in the activities most appropriate for their age and their roles. So thinking about technolo technological advancements, things that were available today weren't available even five years ago. So our goal today is to empower you, whether you are a user of assistive technology or a clinician or a supplier, to empower everybody to keep asking the deep questions so that the final solution matches the need. So the equipment and process 
and you'll hear me mention stakeholders multiple times today. The equipment process really involves in the center, the consumer, and then the supplier and the clinician and the funding resources and all the medical team members surrounding that consumer. So today I'm gonna to really be guiding people how to enter that process uh, with knowledge for all the other stakeholders so that the consumer and the center is really able to uh, guide the other stakeholders towards that final solution. So our hope is that you'll leave here today with a solid foundation of information that you can take with you to your medical appointments if you're a consumer um, to help everybody offer the features that may be of best most benefit to you. And the other why I really want to touch on is that research really um, reflects that the importance of a good match is essential and it's essential for many reasons that we're going to go into later but this study is I think a very um, quick snapshot that summarizes it best and this study was done specifically for folks with spinal cord injuries um, in 2004 included 70 folks and what they really asked was what were the were the most important um, key, key uh, features, I, sh I should say, that would help your life function in terms of the, the wheelchair, but also not just the wheelchair, what other barriers in your life are barriers, not just the equipment, but barriers that have blocked your function or returning to function. And in this study, they found that the wheelchair was reported as the most commonly limiting factor, followed by the actual injury or physical impairment and environment. So. I thought this was a stunning finding that that the equipment superseded the actual injury as to the biggest barrier. So everyone needs to understand and grasp that we have to get this right. And as the technology advances and exists, we have to keep educating ourselves, whether you're a consumer or a supplier or clinician, and keep educating insurance providers because it's happening at such a rapid pace and keep advocating for updates to what is covered so that we can get that right match for function. So the service delivery process um, can really be a process that varies. So traditionally, the funding source is kind of the first start of the conversation. Well, what will, what will insurance cover for this, this person? Or what will insurance cover for me? And then the manufacturer and the supplier and the clinician start to really guide and, and limit what available features um, are offered. And the consumer is kind of that last piece. But what, what in many places, and I think increasingly should be the best practice, is that the consumer is driving that conversation. It starts with, what do I need? What Here's what my needs are and my function, not just medical needs, but functional needs and life role needs. You bring that to the clinician, the supplier, and the, and the manufacturer, and then the funding question is last, so that you can be offered what you need, you can choose what you want to re request or pursue, and then it may be a combination of funding sources. So that, that different direction of the service delivery is the shift in best practice that really has happened over the last 15 years, but I think many, many people are just getting caught up to that. So let's dive right in. You have, um, we're talking about preparing for your evaluation before you even get to your clinic visit, before you even get to the doctor, okay? So what we're gonna do is talk about, you've already decided, all right, I need a new device or I need a change in my device. Either it's worn out and needs replacement or your needs have changed and it needs to be modified or at, tweaked in some way uh, to make it meet your new need. You have, may have discussed this with your doctor or your equipment supplier, and they have sent you to a therapist for a more detailed evaluation. And you have your appointment, what's next? You have an appointment on the calendar, what's next? Well, before that appointment, you really want to take the time and prepare by thinking about what impact the equipment has on many aspects of your life. And we're gonna first start with body functions. The physician or the therapist evaluating you for your wheelchair equipment will most likely have access to your diagnosis. However, you need to bring more details regarding how these diagnoses impact your function. For example, regarding skin, having not just a diagnosis of pressure injury from the past, 
but also talking about any issues with moisture, whether it be incontinence or sweating, any issues with sh sliding around in your seating system that would cause friction or shear that would cause a wound. Um, talking about different surfaces you use, commodes, bed surfaces, vehicle surfaces, so that that clinician and that supplier can think about all of those factors as it relates to your skin and your posture. Regarding spasticity or spasms, what triggers it? If you have that in your body, be it for different reasons, what triggers it? What helps it? How do you currently manage that? And what would you like to do differently? Maybe your limbs have swelling um, and, and tell us where. How do you manage it currently? And how could you be more independent in managing that? So this slide is really about body function specific and then bringing that question to your team. The other pieces, of course, is your activities of daily living, your dressing and bathing, brushing teeth, combing hair, managing your bowel and bladder programs. Again, you wanna think about this before you get to the appointment and, and even bring notes because each of these functions require a specific position and your team is going to want to either be cued to ask you or, or want that information without even needing that, um, that question. Are you able to breach those sink faucets adequately? Um, can you actually maneuver your chair to get to your sink so that you can be more independent? Does your chair need to elevate or tilt forward to make sure that you can more independently do your grooming at the sink? Would seat elevation help your transfers be more safe to the toilet and back? Um, that's the piece that, again, you need to prepare, I would recommend, that um, you prepare before your visit so that your team can efficiently start to write down some ideas. Continuing with the ADLs, there's other ADLs that are just as essential, which is your meal prep, um, feeding yourself or being fed. And then again, I already mentioned transfers, but all of these different tasks are typical ADL tasks that can be considered in your evaluation and in your advocacy for new features. Laundry, for example, child care, for example. And this overlaps um, um, in terms of thinking about other environments of use. You know, although insurance really for, for traditional Medicare oftentimes will kind of keep talking about in-home use, of course, your whole team knows to need needs to know about all your feature, all your um, environments, your surfaces, your um, turning radius needs in terms of in-home as well as other places, whether it be school or the office. How are you doing with transporting your vehicle? And also in terms of your seat to floor height for reaching overhead cabinets or essential things that can't be moved. There's certain things such as um, a thermostat in a house, a door lock system that you cannot reach nor, nor can you actually change your current chair to, to help address those essential needs. So just keep talking, to, keep thinking about it and keep writing these notes down before you get to your appointments so that you can know what's available. Um, also in terms of environments of use, this overlaps with you know, social and family needs in terms of what houses do you frequently go to on a regular basis? What surfaces again in the community do you, do you need? And other life roles. If you think about these life roles and, and really lay it out for the team, you may be a parent and have children of multiple ages. And, you know, in this example, you know, Senator Tammy Duckworth has two little ones. One is very, very little. Um, and her needs as a parent are different than a parent who is, you know, at the daily school activities, uh, or you may have multiple kids with every age. So you have to be able to advocate that you have to go to parent-teacher conferences, again, after COVID ends, which it will end. Um, but these, these parenting roles are just as important to bring to the table. If you have a service animal or different involvement in the community for um, volunteerism or school settings. And oftentimes, here's a good example. Senator Duckworth has different tools in her toolbox. She uses an ultralight manual wheelchair, but she also uses a prosthetic. Uh, so again, it doesn't mean that you have to have one tool in your toolbox. You may need different tools in your toolbox for different settings. 
Um, and it, it's okay to have that conversation in the clinic and then figure out what are your funding options. And again, just uh, different examples of community engagement. We have um, that, that example of a student in college. We have that example of somebody that might be protesting in their environments. Uh, we may have you know, a wheelchair user that is super, super active in the community as uh, a business person or a lawyer. So filling your team in with the information about you is what's gonna get you the best result. And you also wanna bring to the table information about what equipment you currently have and also what equipment you have tried in the past. Um, this is the information that the team needs to know and document. You know, they may, may need to retest some of these items to have that objective data or measurable data that they can show to insurance that the device has been ruled out. But some of these devices can be ruled out based on just your functional assessment in clinic. But if you've had previous experience with these devices, please bring that forward to the evaluation. And how do we ensure access to options? Well, we have to talk about them. And we can either wait till someone brings it forward, or we can do some research ahead of time and ask the questions. Um, or we can just ask the questions. I want to know about all my options. So those, those, that's the, the, the piece that is my emphasis today is it's important to discuss and important to ask questions. And we know there's many options from simple walking devices that may, need the, may meet the need during part of your day, or there's onto the more complex devices. And we're gonna get into more detail uh, later on today. But for this course, we're talking primarily about wheeled mobility devices. So that was a lot of information about the prep, the things to think about before you even get to that clinical assessment. But now what I want to do is talk about what next. So your goals are what the clinical team and you will start to um, use as the guide to the device. So your goal for being able to sit comfortably over a functional day the goal to get you where you want to go with confidence, the goal that you can do the things you want to do and, and maybe do some things that you currently can't do so that with these new features, you might be able to be more independent or need less caregiver assistance. Obviously, you want to have that device fit in your house as well as is transportable um, and that it's easy to use and take care of. So. Here we are, you've done all that prep work and we're at the clinical appointment. This is where the PT or physical therapist or occupational therapist is going to do a more detailed evaluation. Um, and this is where your preparation pays off. So you're gonna share that criteria you're looking for and share that detail about your life needs. And then that therapist is gonna perform a detailed evaluation of your strength, your joint range of motion, your mobility, your posture, and how your current equipment is meeting or not meeting your needs. And oftentimes a second appointment is needed for equipment trials. That's when more detailed measurements will be taken uh, with the supplier oftentimes present. And that's where there should be a discussion about different brands to choose from, different ways that they're set up uh, so that you can make an informed decision. The big takeaway here that I would share with you is that you are driving that decision. Being able to try different chairs and features as well as different seating and different adjustments will give you that important information as you make your decision about what would work best for your needs. While there's no guarantee all the features are covered by insurance, you're still the driver of the process. Um, and plan ahead. I mean, ask about the likelihood of issues with insurance and ask about alternative funding for features that are not covered. And we, were, we will go through some great resources at the end today about some alternative funding options that people have been able to use. And then of course, there's the waiting period. You know, prior to that, you got to a final prescription, the whole team and you feel comfortable, you've made your decisions, and now they're gonna submit to insurance and there is a waiting period and that's, that's just part of the process. So, 
sometimes it's a quick process and sometimes it's longer because questions come back. Um, oftentimes another visit might be beneficial to go back to the therapist, go back to your physician and get more details. The, the insurance may ask for those more details and that's just part of making sure that you can answer any questions that they have. During this period, it's a great time to think about, does my home need to be adapted? Do I need to start thinking about that lift or that ramp or widening doors because I'm going to a little bit wider device than my last? This is that planning phase to, to give you that opportunity to work on it before your device is paid for. And I really wanna emphasize this next concept. So the framework that insurance uses when reading the therapist documentation is they wanna know why these features are needed medically. And the bar that we're used to really um, having to cross is that we have to show as clinicians that we've considered and ruled out lesser devices. So that cane, that walker, that manual wheelchair, if we're going for power. And then we have to show that we've talked about and we're recommending the least costly alternative. So when I say that, I don't mean the cheapest. I mean the least costly alternative that is equally effective at meeting your needs. And what that means, if, if you have three power wheelchairs and they all offer the same three features that meet your, they're equally effective in meeting your needs, then you really have to, the, the therapist and the team really talk, ha, needs to talk about what is the least costly alternative to insurance um, and, and picking that least costly alternative within that category of being all apples to apples. We're not talking apples to a lesser device, we're talking least costly within equally effective devices. So it, sometimes I think there's confusion um, in clinics uh, from what, what we mean by least costly, but I wanna emphasize it has to be an apples to apples comparison that is equally effective for that client. And then regarding insurance criteria still, we wanna remember that um, we have folks on the webinar from Canada as well as the US. And in the US, we are well aware that Medicare guides a lot of insurance coverage policies, even for private insurance and Medicaid, but there is another side to this. As a team, and as those stakeholders that are all involved in this process, we need to respect the funding guidelines, but we are also going to recommend what is most appropriate to meet the functional needs and medical needs in support of independence and reducing complications. So there may be some challenging conversations with the team because maybe a, a team may be more focused on on just the guidelines, but it's important for consumers to know, continue to ask questions and collect information. And in rare instances, you may need to seek out a different equipment supplier who's willing to submit to insurance, even if there are expected challenges. This ensures that you have the right to appeal if you get a denial, that's your right. If insurance says no, you always have the right to, to appeal. So we need to make sure in the clinician world and in the, in the supplier world that we're not that barrier to that uh, appeal right. And if the supplier is not comfortable or not willing to submit to insurance, that's blocking your right to appeal or ask for a fair hearing to pursue approval. Also, many alternative funding agencies or grants do require a denial from insurance to show that that avenue has already been pursued before they'll be able to support you with grant offerings. So in Canada, um, if not going through government funding, um, it can be through private insurance, which are not bound to government guidelines and every insurance will be different. There is a veterans association um, that, that system that is a different entity, there's workman's comp. So again, there's, there's just different criteria for different entities. Um, and again, they also have many alternative funding uh, options as well. So Jennifer, let's go ahead and launch poll question number two. All right, excellent. Here is our second poll question. So if you are a consumer, a provider, clinician that also 
who uses a mobility device, let us know uh, if you use a power chair, a manual chair, a manual wheelchair with power assist, or a different, I, I just, we put an other category. Uh, maybe that might be an assistive device. Uh, so it looks like we have a pretty even amount um, between power wheelchairs, it's about 36%. Manual about 30, well, it keeps moving <laughs> about 37% and about 29% other, but we, we are getting a little bit of fluctuation there. So, um, and one person that does use a manual wheelchair with power assist. Great, thank you, Jenna. That's great to know going into this next section. So, in this next session, we're going to just touch first on manual wheelchair categories. Um, and many folks on the call are aware of this if you're a supplier or a clinician, but um, it's important to remember there's that this whole range of adjustability in manual wheelchairs. And I just want to first say, keep in mind the codes you see on the slide are specific to the US. Um, so in Canada, you're not going to be um, needing to be familiar with these codes of K001 through five and six and seven. So, but in these, in these categories, the variation from standard on the far left all the way through the ultralight manual wheelchair, which is the second from the left, is the, the difference is that it's adjust, it comes in adjustability. So the first three categories, standard through lightweight, which is that third slide in from the left, are really just very basic chairs, oftentimes just for in the trunk of the car, so maybe somebody you're with in the family needs that when they get tired to be dependently pushed. Um, and a very intermittent use type chair. In a K4 category, it's, that's where you start to introduce a little bit more adjustability, a little bit more reduction in weight, uh, but the highly adjustable frame is the K5. So in, in terms of, who needs that high adjustability? Well, that's evolved over time. These oftentimes were thought of as sport chairs, but that's actually not what they're geared towards in the last 20 years, hasn't been what they're actually geared towards. This is the most adjustable category of chair to allow each chair to fit each person individually so that as they push all day in their chair, and this is for kind of that all day user or most of the you know, primary mobility device, um, that it's set up to reduce complications and ensure that they are um, not uh, not not given barriers to, as to how it fits in their house. It's very configurable. It can be a very small footprint, and it is uh, a reduced weight. But oftentimes, individuals that require a wheelchair for a majority of the day are prescribed a lower end chair, not because it meets all their needs, but because in the clinic, they could propel it 30 feet or more during that rehab or clinic trial. The clinical trials may not and often not representative of the settings in which you function. So it's important for you to think about, are you being evaluated at your peak time of the day when you're in terms of energy where you look the best, but it's actually not an accurate depiction of how you are over there a typical 12 hour day? Um, could the device, uh, could you actually propel that device throughout the day or only when you're fresh? Uh, and then you're exhausted by noon and you're in a recliner the rest of the day. Um, also, and that's the information this team needs to know, and that's where home trials also are very helpful. But if you use your wheelchair as your primary mobility device independent for independence, that does need to be the more adjustable wheelchair frame. That adjustability allows the rear largest wheels to be moved forward, to most align with your shoulders, to take resistance off the front wheels, and to make that chair a smaller footprint. And the medical team for the most part should understand this, but if they are less experienced with wheelchair evaluations, they may not see the risk of using lesser devices over time. And they, you seem to be doing all right, what is the issue? Well, the issue is you are compensating all the time. So over time, what happens with that compensation? A lot of the users on this call may already have experienced some of these things. Oftentimes with the shoulder, you get rot rotator cuff damage. With the elbow, you get overuse uh, diagnoses such as epicondylitis. 
and in the wrist, you oftentimes are more susceptible to carpal tunnel syndrome. So again, when we talk about prevention, it's not prevention in terms of this might happen, but it's more a matter of if you're a full-time wheelchair user and it, your chair is not set up for you, you are in a much higher likelihood of experiencing these things. And aside from those um, propulsion pieces, in a manual wheelchair, you are, and in a power chair, you're much lower than a person who is standing. So these overhead reaching activities uh, increase the strain on your shoulder, as well as the transfer techniques that we use if you're uh, able to assist with your transfers or do independent transfers. So we want to think about the wear and tear that happens with all of these activities. And I want to give you some, some data regarding cost, because again, least costly alternative. Uh, when we think about advocating for a more appropriate device right off the bat, I think we have a real case to make regarding saving healthcare dollars by prescribing appropriately right off the bat. And by this, I mean a person who needs rotator cuff surgery or repair, for example, in a study done by Dr. Stephen Narvi in 2016, these numbers I'm gonna show you were just the cost of the actual operating suite. So Medicare for the sutures, the implant um, pieces, should there need to be uh, you know, different, um, I'm not talking about rotator, uh, a shoulder re replacement, I'm talking about little um, implant costs for maybe a, a button to hold the, the cuff in place or, um, other little uh, pieces that they may need. So operation costs for Medicare was $6,367 and for other insurances, slightly higher. But you also have rehab. You had pre-op visits with an occupational or a physical therapist. You have post-op visits uh, for, for trying to actually rehab from this surgery. And so that's cost. Not to mention, the indirect costs that you experience. So you're not allowed to propel your manual wheelchair for possibly six weeks or more. Your transfer technique may be very, and it will be very impacted and require more caregiver assistance. Your dressing techniques, transfer ch techniques, and position changes will require more assistance. You might need to rent a power wheelchair and a transportation options may change. You may have to take off work um, if you are uh, employed. And again, your caregiver fees are gonna go up. So these indirect costs are extremely expensive to the system and to your own personal out-of-pocket costs. So I think that there is a real case to, um, to make for saving and being a good steward of healthcare dollars by getting a, a, the possibly the uh, more configurable device right from the start. And also in terms of considerations for saving dollars, you wanna ask about durability. Um, each chair that is um, on the market is supposed to go through basic durability testing. I'm just gonna run these videos a little bit as we talk. But these testing regard is, is uh, completing 200,000 cycles on this roller test with these slats to kind of simulate uh, kind of the seams on the sidewalk. So 200,000 cycles, and then it must go through a drop test, completing 6,666 cycles. Now, there has to be a weighted dummy in, in these videos, it's a 265-pound dummy. So if you think about the durability testing that these chairs go through, all chairs should be able to pass these tests. Well, that's not necessarily always the case. So it's important for you to ask your supplier and clinician for durability information so that you can find out about what manufacturers come out testing with the most long lasting chairs. And I'm not gonna spend much time on this slide, but there is data about durability. And these are three classifications of failures. And just real quick, class three failures are your catastrophic failures, like the frame broke, the seat cracked, uh, it bent. Um, so class, class three failures are catastrophic all the way to class one, which are very minor. Anything that could be tightened up. Maybe the, the heel strap loosened. Maybe um, the backrest needs to be a little bit tweaked, but nothing catastrophic. Your most durable chairs were in that ultralight 
category. Um, and it's because they're meant to be for full-time use. They're designed for that durability and they're tested for that durability. Um, the other piece is the in-betweeners. And again, this is kind of the lower end chairs. These still had pretty significant piece uh, issues, caster bolts being bent. Um, but again, if you're not using it full-time, this is probably manageable um, and you won't be stranded. But if you're trying to use this full-time in every environment you use, you're gonna end up having downtime that will either impact your work, your school participation, or in general, just lead you to being in bed more often. So again, great stewardship in terms of healthcare dollars, I believe, um, as well as insurance, uh, I'm sorry, research um, is able to support that you're actually gonna save funding um, resources if asking for that more appropriate device right off the bat. Now we're gonna to touch on material options. And there are different material options in manual wheelchairs. There's the ultralight category um, of aluminum, titanium, and carbon fiber wheelchair frames. And they each have their place. All are adjustable frames because they're in that ultralight category, but where they vary is durability. Um, active clients require a more durable product. And again, by active, I'm talking about folks that um, might be out and about all the time because they are employed, they're a community organizer, they're a parent, um, they are uh, basically on different surfaces on a regular basis. So with this, you know, in terms of this slide, titanium does prove out to be the strongest um, of the three materials I mentioned, and it's 30, uh, 360 times stronger percent, I should say, stronger than aluminum. It's virtually corrosion resistant. So those folks living on the coast, this is an important factor and they have a very high fatigue endurance, meaning they're gonna really withstand a lot of repetitive stresses. So asking what your options are in titanium, if you fall into that category of, or, of very active. So in summary, the ultralight manual wheelchair benefits include highly adjustability, high adjustability, being able to accept a variety of seating options. Um, and again, their most durable, meaning lower maintenance costs uh, and cost savings over time, especially considering the five year rule for expected wheelchair lifetime. So just because someone tells you it's more expensive in the beginning, in actuality, providing more cost savings to the system over time is important. And this strongly supports the goal of stewardship and saving healthcare dollars when we're discussing and advocating with all healthcare, um, with all stakeholders involved. But what if a manual wheelchair isn't the solution? The alternatives would be power assist devices such as a smart drive here on the left hand side, or all the way up to power wheelchairs. What, but let, in terms of power assist versus power wheelchair, I think about this in terms of, again, environments of use and types of use. So what if your home can't accommodate a power chair or your vehicle, or you can propel your ultralight manual wheelchair only part of the day and then you're again so tired or painful that that functional day ends at two in the afternoon. Power assist can be a significant important consideration either as a bridge before power or a way to avoid ever needing power. It allows you to retain that transportability that you are already using with your manual wheelchair. It allows you to reduce your strain and stress on your arms. Maybe you're already having signs of degeneration, but with that power option to actually give you that push, you're just steering. Um, and it really can be your kind of bridge. But in terms of, oh, excuse me here, let me back up. In terms of, um, making that decision, you really want to try again, try a power assist device in your environments. So when I think about power assist, there's a lot of different areas that it would impact. Maybe you have deep carpet at home, which really is like pushing through deep mud for a manual wheelchair user. Maybe you need to carry a laundry basket. Maybe you need to push a baby stroller or, or complete your mopping, sweeping, um, other you know, activities that you actually need assist to push. So it's a significant consideration. And again, it's important to go through trials 
uh, to really determine if it's the right solution for you. This is a great video. Um, here's here's Darius. I'm not going to play the video yet, but he is uh, a gentleman with a T6, T7 paraplegia. And in the video, it shows how he uses the smart drive to push a grocery cart. And he does have functional strength, but he's got decreased trunk musculature. And it can be potentially um, difficult to balance a grocery basket on the lap. And he's not limited in the items he can purchase um, by having to you know, just use a small basket instead of a full cart. So again, shifting the thinking for smart drive, not only for long distances, but to see you know, how this could really impact functional tasks. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. Catherine, did you want to play it from the other window? Yeah, is it looking pretty choppy? Um, a little bit. Yeah, let's do it from, I'll do it from okay. there. Okay, so again, a great example of how you can tie that to a functional task, not just distances. Now we're going to talk about the need to what you need to know about the power mobility or the power wheelchair features when you're in the clinic and talking with the suppliers, um, because there's different options. There's scooters. There's kind of the more basic group two power wheelchairs, which are limited in in the seating they can accept, as well as the seating features for power seating features, all the way up to the more complex chairs that really offer features that may be needed. So going back to your goals for the device, what device can meet those needs the best? Um, what are the limitations of those, of those devices? And that's the conversation you need to think about. Uh, which ones offer me the seating I need? Which ones are transportable and which ones aren't? Which ones can get higher to access a table or help me with my reaching activities into the fridge? Those are the type of questions that you need to bring to the table. And if for those on the call, if you've never driven a power wheelchair before and you're thinking about moving to power, it's important to try devices in your own environment, not, not just in the open clinic environment, so that you can make a more informed choice about what works best for you. Things to think about here are accessibility and maneuverability. So let's look at accessibility regarding turning radius. This is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, and you're gonna hear discussions about rear wheel drive and mid wheel drive and front wheel drive options. And there's pros and cons to each. There's no one answer for everyone, but trying these devices in your home is essential. For example, this device on the left-hand side is a front wheel drive device and it pivots differently. It pivots and the way, if you notice in that pivot, it allowed it in this bathroom configuration, it allowed that chair to be right in front of the sink at the end. Same sink, same bathroom configuration, and here's a mid-wheel drive. And mid-wheel drives just have two more casters in the front, so it does impact how it pivots, and now you're a little bit off-center. Now, it doesn't mean you can't rearrange yourself, but it's just important to try it. These are both wonderful devices, but it's important to really understand the difference and they both act differently on uneven surfaces, and they both act differently as they climb things. So pros, cons, important to try. Now we're talking about power seating functions, and there's power tilt, recline, both elevating leg rest, and stand. And again, asking what, what they're used for and how they can help you. And again, I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but we spend a lot of healthcare dollars on pressure injuries. So not just the direct costs, but the home health or outpatient interventions, the hospitalizations, the bed rest. There's a lot of different problems that happen when you don't get features that allow you to manage your pressure. There's also a lot of rehospitalizations that occur, and this is more specific to spinal cord injury, but this, some of these are, have a little bit of an overlap with uh, diagnoses such as multiple sclerosis, but there's problems with bowel and bladder. Um, if you're not able to change position 
Um, uh, and, and so oftentimes these hospitalizations, could you actually reduce your risk of these problems or reduce your risk for going back to the hospital because of bowel and bladder issues or uh, breathing issues by getting a standing wheelchair, just things to talk about with your team. And this is just a brief, again, example of how other functional tasks can be tied to those power features. And this is a great um, slide, again, reminding about your chair might need to elevate and forward tilt, or uh, this is in, in, uh, in terms of our chairs, it would be the active reach, active height features. And these really allow function. These are not, ta these are not upgrades. These are uh, not items of convenience. These are items that now exist that didn't, that are available for functional tasks. Um, so sometimes insurance will push back saying it's an upgrade. Well, it's, it's, it's just new technology. Regarding seating, there's different cushions and different backrests. Um, touch, touching on cushions, I think it's really important for folks to really sit on the cushions that are being offered, really try these cushions so that they can get a sense of if it helps with their stability, how does that impact how I move in and out of my chair, um, is it comfortable? And then also it's important to know that insurance usually doesn't cover a second cover um, unless possibly you're in the VA system, but just it's it's okay to still ask for coverage for a backup. Maybe that backup cover will be covered, or maybe that backup cover will be something that maybe you can get extra funding for. Same thing with back supports regarding trying it. A lot of these shapes and contours will really help stabilize posture, but you need to know how it's going to impact your transfers. And there's a lot of options that can be done to make sure that you both have stability and are able to transfer. Additional considerations are, especially for manual wheelchairs, you want to avoid adding a, a ton of weight if it's items you don't need most of the time, uh, because that ton of weight is really going to impact how easy it is to push. Uh, you want to make sure that you can have the safety and positioning items that you need on your chair um, when, it, when you're being transported in another device or if you're moving at higher speeds. Maybe you don't like a seat belt, but you want it sometimes, just buckle it behind you um, when you're not using it. And also ask about quality. Insurance uh, really expects the seat cushion to last at least two years before they'll consider covering a replacement, but sometimes now insurance is saying five years. So make sure you ask about the quality of the foam and the quality of the hardware so that you can select a good device. And again, funding information and resources are available. Uh, and we do have resources at Permobile for Permobile US and Permobile Canada. Um, so we have resources that we're gonna put, that we did put in the chat box, but we're also going to include, um, if you go to our website, we have a funding um, resource, but we also have for clinicians and for suppliers, we have an LMN generator. So what that is, is it's a place you can go to kind of look at some of the explanation or the phraseology that is used when you already know what you want to get for the client, but you have to justify it, but you're not sure how to word it, we can help with that. There are resources available. And then we do have resources regarding funding, funding questions and funding um, uh, guidelines to answer questions. Okay, so for some of these folks, you're going to have, for some of these, um, instances you're going to have a denial possibly and that's not the end of the process you have the right to appeal the appeal the denial information is supposed to guide you through that process your supplier can guide you through that process as well um, and it's and it's okay many denials are overturned and you do end up with the devices but you have to participate you have to be the one uh, to request an appeal uh, you're supposed to get a denial copy and it, there's directions on how to go through that process. But your therapist and your supplier or your manufacturer can help with um, answering some of the questions. If after the appeal it still is denied, you can request a fair hearing. And that's a hearing with a non-biased judge, oftentimes by phone, where they go through your case and you can, again, advocate for what you feel you need and you can have other uh, specialists on the line with you to support you. And then again, after the appeal, there are other 
venue uh, avenues. Sometimes there's a disability rights attorney that can be at your hearing to help with you with that process. Um, and again, you can have other witnesses such as your therapist or your supplier or your doctor. And we do have those resources coming up, but there are community resources such as your church, civics groups, GoFundMe. There's lots of clients that have had success through GoFundMe's or the Bureau of Vocational Rehab, which is a national, it's run by the states um, program that they will pay for equipment that you need for your employment or potential employment that maybe insurance did not cover. This is just a snapshot of what our list of alternative funding resources looks like from the US side, but there is, and you can see on this slide, a link to a resource guide for Canada. Okay, and briefly, we're talking now that you've got your product. Finally, your, your mobility device, you're in the clinic, you're getting training and you're being fit. And then you go to home and you are starting to use it, but it may not be perfect. You may need uh, multiple visits to dial in your seating. That team is there for you and they won't know there's a problem unless you ask. Also, you might need to practice on new features. Um, so please be uh, be aware that 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 is expected. Um, it's normal to have multiple visits and it's okay. You don't have to live with it if it's not working for you. Um, and then there's the maintenance side. You know, your supplier, always let them know before things get catastrophic that you're needing some service. Uh, don't let things get so loose that the wheels are falling off. The technician, the service technician can go to you or you can go to them and take care of things before they become catastrophic. Insurance really expects you to be a willing participant to um, maintain things, even if you can't physically do it. Part of the maintenance is just alerting your team. So the take home message is that you are the center of this process and your lead greatly impacts this process. And presenting your needs from the start and throughout is essential to getting your needs met. And what, what happens when choice is not offered or requested? You end up with something that doesn't meet your needs. So always be that engine behind that process. And then again, this is to um, a really take home message that I think is important is that participation is key from the consumer side and the therapist side and the supplier side and the manufacturer side to make sure that we, that insurance continues to offer access to things as well as opens the door to access to new technology. So, you know, what we don't know, we don't protect. And what you don't protect, you lose. So we don't want to lose access, nor do we want to be shut out of access to the technology that we all enjoy. So participating through access to CRT.org is an excellent uh, organization and a resource for how to participate. And we wanna thank the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation for co-sponsoring today's webinar. Um, as many of you know, they offer many excellent resources on their website, such as the Paralysis Resource Guide. Um, and there are many local resources listed as well. And before we get into the questions, I wanna remind everybody that we do have an upcoming webinar uh, on Thursday, November 12th. The title of that webinar is Expect More from Your Cushion, Introducing the New Rojo Hybrid Select Cushion, uh, offered or presented by Angela Rieger. And Jenna, do we want to open up to questions? I know I kind of ran long-winded, but anything that we want to try to answer before we end? Sure, and feel free to add questions as we go uh, into your question box on your GoToWebinar chat. Um, I did get a request to repeat the LMN generator ref, uh, source, and I did put that in the chat box. Um, it's www.permobilelmn.com, and you'll request a login, and then you'll be able to um, utilize some of those term searches and sample letters that, um, that Catherine was uh, referring to. 
And then I've gotten a couple of comments about some additional resources for funding. And in your follow-up email, we have um, Canadian, a link to Canadian funding resources as well as US funding resources. Um, two that have been mentioned on the chat box. Um, one is an organization called Help Hope live and that will actually help you to form your own nonprofit organization so that it does not if you did raise funds you're not penalized as taxable income if you were to purchase um, a component or a device with that fund. And then the second, um, again, we're not advising or endorsing, just providing resources, uh, is CARE Credit. And that can, that is a, a credit card, essentially a credit account that can be used towards medical um, purchases and medical expenses. So we will have those resources linked to you in your follow up email. Um, and uh, so that you can refer back to that at your next convenient time period. And um, let's see any other questions that have come in. We got lots of great comments, Catherine, about the passion that you express for this topic. Um, let's see. Yeah, so, so there was a question about, you know, a consumer, a, a a person who uses a mobility equipment, if they're in their appointment and, you know, someone is uh, the provider clinician, maybe states like, oh, we don't need to, you know, take all those measurements or we don't need to check all those boxes. The manufacturer will know exactly what's needed. How, how do you have any advice on, you know, how to just communicate and explain what measurements are needed and how a person could go about that? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, because there are many, many roles and as I said, stakeholders involved. And in some clinics, the clinicians will take measurements. Um, and in some instances, the supplier or the manufacturer's rep will take measurements. Um, I think the important piece though, I would recommend is that these measurements are taken as a team. And the reason is, is oftentimes when I was in wheelchair seating clinic, um, we would take measurements, but then I would, it's a lot of collaboration. The measurement, uh, for example, your upper leg, um, uh, back of the buttocks to back of the knee. Well, it, it, there's, a, there's different factors as to what that translates to, if, depending on how you like to sit. Does the person's knee, do they like to have a tight, tucked position where the knees are very, very bent? Um, that's going to impact the final recommendation for the length of the seat cushion or the length of the seat sling or the length of the seat pan. So clinically, those discussions, um, I, I think, are the culmination of the measurements and the person's posture. And that, that measurement will determine what the final product, how, it, how it's set up. So per, my preference is, um, is that if, if you can't take those measurements as a team, before the final measurements are considered, there should at least be uh, a phone call between the clinician, as long as they understand how you like to sit, and the um, manufacturer shop or the supplier, but ideally all at the same time, because it's much, it's, it's surprising how much uh, a wheelchair order can change based on how the person likes to sit. Um, so that would be my recommendation, is, is doing it together in clinic. Um, and if that's not realistic, at least having that conversation uh, yeah. so that the final so the final configuration matches what you're hoping to get. Excellent. And it's okay to ask questions on what is necessary and what's not necessary. Exactly. Um, well, thank you. We are coming to the close of our webinar here. So thank you all so much and we will go ahead and sign off. Thank you and have a great rest of your week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Catherine, thank you, for your great presentation. Oh, thank you, Jenna.